Okay, great. Well, well good morning. Uh, sorry for being a little late this morning. Uh, my name is John Walsh. I work with ESB Innovation for the last two months, but for the previous five years I worked in Tesco as the energy manager. So what I was hoping to do this morning was to share our journey with fridge optimization over the last three years. And it's great to see so many of the team who've been part of that journey here today as well. So if anybody has any extra insights or lessons learned that you feel would be constructive, please jump in. Um, obviously this is us. Um, so Ireland's a small island on the, the west coast of Europe. But from a fridge perspective, and it's worth just starting with this, it's actually a great place to be a fridge maintenance <coughs> manager or a fridge design engineer because we have a very, very mild climate. So as you can see, you know, our highs, unfortunately, aren't that high. <laughs> and our lows aren't that low. So we have a very mild um, climate. One of the, the quirky things about Ireland, though, which is, again, worth pointing out, is we've got incredibly high humidity. And that's quite bad if you're a fridge engineer because you know, how you manage moisture and defrosting and keeping your fridges optimized and working you know, has a large uh, bearing on you know, what the humidity is. And if you have high humidity, you actually have huge amounts of moisture that you need to clear off your cases and your, your fridge systems. So good news in terms of the, the temperatures, bad news in terms of the humidity. So a little bit about Tesco in Ireland. Um, in Ireland, they have about 150 stores, about 149 stores. Um, the extras are the super big stores. The super stores are kind of the mid-sized stores. And you can see just looking at the profile there, you know, the majority of the stores in Ireland are mid-sized stores. There's about 30 expresses and about 21 petrol stations uh, with about 13,000 retail employees. In, in terms of energy, the estate uses about 170 gigawatt hours per annum of electricity, about 80 gigawatt hours of gas. And then for any of the stores that are off-grid, it uses either um, LPG or a very small amount of um, uh, heating oil and actually more and more wood chip and biomass. So three or four years ago when I started working on the, on the energy team, uh, there was lots of immediate questions that, that jumped out. And, and this graph here is a typical graph of a, of a Tesco store's energy profile. The blue is the amount of electricity that a store uses over a 12-month period. So this is the 1st of January through to the 31st of December. The blue is the fridge profile, so this is all the energy that the fridge uses. The red is lighting, the green is the heating system, uh, the yellow is the bakery, and then the, the pink is on meter, so we're not too sure what that is. But, the, but what you can see here with the blue is it's very erratic. You know, we, we had lots and lots of questions as we started work trying to understand this. You know, why is it so large? Why is it the biggest load in the store by far? You know, why is it so variable? Obviously, there's a dependency with ambient temperature. So you could correlate this to ambient temperature. But really, why are we seeing these sort of huge erratic swings? What's, what's going on here? And when we started to benchmark and map and model stores to stores, you know, what we saw was different stores were behaving very differently to the same conditions. So if we had a temperature swing from, say, 14 to 18 degrees, some stores would react dramatically, and some stores would manage it quite comfortably. And we tried to understand what's driving the different responses to the similar conditions. And then ultimately, we wanted to try and better control the systems. But I guess we had lots and lots of very fundamental questions. But as an energy manager, this was a, a great opportunity, but a great challenge at the same time. So we set up a natural working team. And we tried to find all of the key stakeholders who would have an influence or some expertise or some knowledge on how the fridge systems worked. So we decided we needed to work with the energy team. Also, the maintenance team was going to be a real key stakeholder because they understood the day-to-day -day operations and the history, and they had the engineers in stores working on you know, the different fridges. So they would also be a, a very key stakeholder for us. We had lots and lots of data. So we have a long-term partnership with IMS, who are here today, which is great to see. So you know, they provide the data platform to integrate the um, control systems for our fridges onto the Tesco network. So we had the ability to capture huge amounts of data. So again, we wanted to include them in the uh, natural working team. 
But we also realized that although we had huge amounts of data, we really weren't data mining that data very well. And there was an opportunity there to try and use some big data tools to get some insights and understanding as to you know, how the <coughs> systems were really working, which is why we approached the IBM team at the time. We also brought in Dan Foss, who are our, our fridge control specialists as part of the natural working team. And each week we try and meet on site in one or two stores, we'd understand what was going on, we'd have a look at the data, see what the data was trying to tell us. We'd also have a look at the physical di conditions to see what was physically going on in the stores. The fridge engineers would run some trials or optimize particular cases or particular compressors or condensers. And we would uh, try and understand from the data what were, what were we seeing. And then when we overlay the energy profile, we tried to model out <coughs> how the system was working in practice. So really it was very much an experimental approach, but it was very much data driven at the same time. We tried to break it up into chunk sized pieces. So phase one, which was the first year, we very much focused on the demand side. So that was the bit that happens in the store. It's the cases that hold the ice cream or the cases that hold the, the yogurts and the, the milk. So we tried to understand how do, how do the conditions in the store affect the energy profile and the performance of the fridge system. Uh, the second year, then we focused on what goes on in the, on the roof where the compressors and the condensers are. And then the third phase, which we ran last year, was trying to mirror the, the two, you know, the supply side and the demand side together. So kind of just looking at some of the, the insights we got early on, which drove a lot of the, the thinking, we started to use the, I guess, the data coming out of the IMS platform, applying the IBM big data analytics approach to it to drive out some kind of simple visual ways of looking at how our fridges were performing. Uh, and this one was quite insightful for us because what it shows is how long do different cases take to defrost. And it was a view of the cases that we hadn't seen before. So although we had the data, you know, we were maintaining and running our systems, we hadn't had this perspective. And what we could see quite clearly was that some of our cases were taking about <coughs> 40 minutes to defrost and other cases were just taking just 20 minutes to defrost. And uh, again, you know, it, nothing hugely insightful about this, but it was, you know, applying the big data analytics engines to this allowed us to crunch those huge amounts of data to provide those very simple insights. And when we saw these graphs, we went, oh, you know, there's something to this. Why, why do some of our cases take 40 minutes, some of our cases take 20 minutes? And then we started to have our maintenance and engineering teams do deep dives and try to standardize and you know, apply simple setting changes so that we could drive all of our case performance down to 20 minutes. Uh, and likewise, when we started to look at you know, different temperature profiles of the cases, what we could see was that some of our cases at the end of their defrost cycle were never reaching more than zero or one degree, which meant actually the case was never fully defrosting. And again, it was, the data was there, it was available to us, but if you have 70 million data points per store per year, you very quickly get lost in the volumes and volumes and volumes of data that are there. So once we had identified the issue using the, you know, the data reports, we were able to go in and correct it, put in place the corrective actions and a, a, a new maintenance regime and in this case, we had to reset some of the probes so that we could ensure that our cases were defrosting up to eight or nine degrees each and every time. Uh, again, just a, a different perspective on um, kind of the operational performance of the, the cases in some of the stores. So what we're looking at here is the valves inside the cases and how, you know, how often are they 10% open or 20% open or 50% open. And what we can see for these cases is they've got a nice distribution at about 60%. And this one here is also somewhere between 40 and 50%. But these valves here are stuck open all of the time. They're 100% open. So it means that the case is never been satisfied and that the fridge system is always running to try and keep the cases satisfied. So again, it was, it was using these insights, using a different way of looking at the same data and then having a cross-functional team who could take the data, go back into the store, make the physical change, and then we'd go back and review the performance after the change to see you know, what had happened, allowed us to unlock a lot of the savings that were available to us. And this in terms of you know, ongoing trends, 
what we're looking at here then is a defrost cycle. So we're looking to see how long does it take for a typical case to defrost, and it's taken us about 30 minutes, or it takes about 30 minutes for the case to recover. And then you can see an event here, and the case is taking about 60 minutes, it's taking an hour to recover after a defrost, which again gives us an insight to allow us to send in our engineering and maintenance teams to be able to go and put in place <coughs> a corrective action. So, you know, after, you know, working this through, you know, taking the data, doing the data crunches, developing insights, you know, working in the store with the engineering team, making the corrective actions, going back and looking at the data again. It was very much an iterative process for about a year. It allowed us to develop a number of insights and come up with some policy changes which we were able to apply. So, so one significant one we made was we were able to change the number of defrosts for our frozen cases from, in this case, it's from four a day down to one a day. <coughs> And what you can see is that this is the energy profile from doing that. So you can see quite a dramatic step change here. And, you know, it's, it's this ability to be able to, you know, look at the data, work the data, make the change, but then to go back and see how does that change take effect, not just on one case or two cases, but across the whole estate is where we found a lot of the power of the kind of the big data engine because when we started to look at just a pure volume of data, sure you could do this for one store or two stores or one case or two cases, but when you start to multiply it up by thousands and thousands of cases, suddenly the data volume became, becomes too much. So over the program, and what we're looking at here is the fridge load for our store in Maynooth. And this is a three-year profile. And what you can see is the summer load is quite high. You know, each year you can see the the summer spike, but what you can also see is the dramatic step down year on year from this program. So when we started, we were running at about three megawatt hours a day. And then after we made a number of the changes, we came down to about a stable two megawatt hours a day, which is about a 33% saving. And we haven't applied any new equipment. We're still running the same number of ice cream cases, the same number of milk cases. All we've done is we've taken the insights from working with the cross-functional maintenance, data, and engineering teams, and brought those three teams together. <coughs> and using data, 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 you know, we've been able to find ways to run our systems in a smarter way. So some of the key learnings, you know, some of our cases have very different profiles, and we were trying to apply the same setting and the same uh, configuration across all our cases in the same ways, but actually some of our cases perform very differently. We found our defrost settings are very important. So things like the drain down time, which we hadn't prioritized, we actually found was a, a, you know, it, was a, it was a key parameter for us. Uh, HVAC can be a big influence. We kind of knew that intuitively. We'd had lots of stories where, you know, in some cases we might have been blowing or directing warm air down onto a fridge. But actually this gave us a great way to prove out the, the theory. Uh, we found we needed to standardize our case set points. And, you know, over time we had seen a little bit of drift across our estate, but you know, in terms of applying a big data blanket across our estate, it allowed us to very much standardize uh, pretty, pretty much everywhere. Uh, we also found that store temperatures have a large influence on some of our systems. So when we were able to take some of the temperature out of the stores at night time, we saw quite a strong performance on our fridge system. And just in general, there were lots and lots of opportunities to better operate the fridge estate through data automation. So, so that profile of a 33% saving, you know, that, that's been our, our primary store. But in general, we've seen kind of 20% savings in the other stores where we've deployed similar um, policy changes. But I, I guess the key lesson for me has been, you know, the collaboration between different teams. I think no one team has all of the skills and all of the experience to be able to unlock these sort of savings. But when you start to bring together data, maintenance, engineering, and, and bring together natural working teams and drive that collaboration, you can really unlock large savings. So, any, any questions? What, what did you do with HVAC? What, what learning did you have on the stock temperature and what did you do to reduce the rotation? Uh, I, I guess there, were, there was two things. Uh, one was that we, um, made sure we weren't directing any <coughs> supply ducts or supply fans directly down onto cases, particularly the, the well cases 
are, are highly sensitive to HVAC. And then the other thing we do is we apply a night setback so that ni at night time we allow the store temperatures to fall away and we see a strong benefit on the fridges when we allow the store temperatures to fall away at the same time. Uh, but both, both, but we, we, we see the uh, chilled, you know, the, the, the chilled case has been a lot more sensitive than the frozen cases. Just to maybe add one commentary to that because it kind of was an interesting curiosity from our side of the house with data. One of the key drivers of the HVAC interaction was on the basis that we saw the 25th of December is the only day of the year where the store is actually unoccupied. And you actually see when you analyze the data, you can actually see there's a significant difference in the, the energy load, all of the control data is, is definitely statistically different than, than, than Christmas Day. And that's just basically one of those original thoughts that said there's something going on on Christmas Day that makes it different than all of the other days. And then that's when the HVAC conversation started. So we kind of got that for free when we actually did the work originally. And, and it's one of the key ones that we found that you know data does drive you down a particular road. And as I said, we got it for free, given the fact that Christmas Day was was, was so free. Yeah. Did you track any uh, replenishment in refrigeration cases? So more stuff going in? Did you do any of that analytics? The behaviour of people in the cases? We, we did a piece, and there is some correlation, but the we changed our operating model for replenishment a number of times as we went through the program. So there, there is something to it, but we could never d design a clean experiment. Um, and I think that's part of just retail operations is they tend to you know, do replenishment, you know, not on an ad hoc basis, but it, it kind of happens continuously through the day. Were they actively involved or were they more about? No, we, we, we didn't engage the retail operations team. John, the data you got, um, was that pulled from, let's say, the controller itself or independent probes or how did it work? Uh, we put, so, so we used the fridge systems uh, control, controller to pull the data on a regular basis and we extracted that data from the fridge controllers. So, so that was for, let's say, the Danfoss, <coughs> that was Danfoss in the store? Yeah. For plug-in equipment that had, you know, non-Danfoss compliant controllers, and that, were you able to monitor that? No, so we didn't go after any non-integrated um, standalone, which I think is probably what you're going to talk to us yeah, yeah. later on in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, thanks for that. Pleasure, thank you.